Today, we're welcomed by author and historic roads expert, Dan Marriott, a previous Olmstead Network board member and a National Trust Program Director. Dan is currently principal of his own consulting practice and a landscape architect professor at Penn State. We're thrilled to have him here today and to announce him as a new member of our Scholars Council. Dan, take it away. Thanks so much for the introduction and hello everybody. Uh, wherever you are. Um, I send you uh, warm greetings from a very chilly central Pennsylvania. So um, um, I want to keep today very casual. Uh, this is the first Lunch and Learn, and I'm kind of uh, going to kind of explore the, the whole method with you guys uh, as well. But uh, rather than a, a formal presentation, I know there's, there's questions about roads, the purpose of roads and parks. Um, and lots of pressures and issues with roads uh, in Olmstead and other historic parks uh, and districts around the country right now, which is very much my background. Uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, finer introduction details, um, my PhD work at University of Edinburgh was looking at the origin of pleasure driving, um, which is a very distinct and very modern idea about how we move through the landscape. Um, and to frame this all, and just give you a slight bit of background, um, Humphrey Repton, uh, the landscape architect. Anybody familiar with Repton? Uh, back in the late uh, late 18th, early 19th century, um, is the first landscape architect that actually articulates the idea of moving in a vehicle in the landscape. Um, it's revolutionary, and there's a convergence right around 1800. Um, if you think about this, driving for pleasure requires a couple of basic things. It requires a good quality road, um, it requires a comfortable vehicle, and it requires a desire to actually go and look at the landscape. Um, and this is really not possible until this period. Uh, roads are incredibly uncomfortable and unsafe. Um, vehicles are extraordinarily unsafe. Um, so going to on an unnecessary drive through a location that um, would be risky, like uh, in the mountains, for example, for great views, um, would be very unwise. Uh, carriages and were notorious for rolling backwards uh, and things like that. So what happens is this convergence. Um, modern road building, the, the foundation of how we build roads today um, is getting established at the end of the 18th century. Um, uh, two Scots, uh, Telford and McAdam, and then a Frenchman, Tresaguet, uh, established how we build roads today. It's revolutionary. Again, this is the pre-rail age. Um, and this is a way to actually look at canals. It's another way of overland travel. Um, we also, with the Industrial Revolution, see modern improvements in the carriage. And Thomas Felton, a London carriage maker, in 1790 proclaims it the age of the modern carriage. Um, because of uh, new metal alloys, there's comfortable suspension and this reliable braking now. And uh, <clears throat> fans of Jane Austen, if there are any of you out there, um, Austen writes quite a bit about driving and carriage touring. Uh, it is in vogue at this point. She even references Repton. And I forget if it's in Pride and Prejudice. I forget which novel it is right now. Um, so carriage driving and moving and looking at scenery, touring uh, is this, this whole new scenic, activities, this new engagement with the landscape. The third thing, we have roads, we have uh, modern vehicles, and the rise of the picturesque movement. Uh, and this is very much the foundation that Olmsted comes into. Um, this new appreciation for the natural landscape and natural beauty. Um, this is all transformative. So people are being told you should go look, sketch, and appreciate these landscapes. Um, there are modern roads now that can actually take you there. Um, and you can travel comfortably in a vehicle. Uh, so travel and tourism based on scenery is rising rapidly this period. Uh, the UK is a particularly strong uh, destination, and Scotland in particular is a very, very strong destination because of the highlands. Um, and the Scots, um, through the Act of Union and British investment, the population economic development, but they have an unintended consequence of spraying popular travel in terms of scenic travel and touring. Um, so that's a quick background for you in terms of the idea of roads, because almost Park, a whole series of, of carriage drives or carriage avenues, as they're called in the early plans for Central Park. And I just want you to have this context about roads. 
um, because they're important. Um, and this comes into a lot of issues that I, I hope will help you to understand a road or a road system you may be looking at in an Olmsted or other historic park system. So I mentioned uh, McAdam and Telford, the two Scottish engineers. Um, they have two different methods of construction. Uh, Telford's is much more expensive and complex. Uh, Macadam's, which you, you've probably heard the term Macadam Road or Tar Macadam, uh, that's where it comes from. Macadam's method was uh, was cheaper and also quite reliable. Uh, but Telford's is much more highly engineered. Um, and if you read the history of Central Park, the whole idea that carriage drives is it's popular. The parks in London have carriage drives and people, the posh, are toying around in very fine carriages right now. Um, and for Central Park to be a proper park based on this idea of what we're looking to back uh, to England, carriage drives are part of the conversation. Um, carriage ownership rises exponentially in New York in the first quarter of the, 20th, the 19th century. Interestingly, if you read the history of Central Park, Olmsted insists that the roads in Central Park will be built in the Telford method, the more expensive method, um, because he anticipates the very heavy use of the roads in the park. Um, so the roads, uh, if you go down below the, the, the carriage drives in Central Park today, you will find Telford. It has a strong stone base uh, that supports the entire road and it has layers of gravel built up on top of that. And I've talked to park archeologists in New York, it's, it's underneath the carriage drives, just waiting for us to rediscover all this. The reason I bring this up, it's not just my own personal passion for my own particular research, um, but the fact that carriage driving is a big deal in park use at this time. It's the new expected thing. Remember back in the, the 70s, there were all the, the exercise crazes in parks. There's all these things periodically that parks go through. We have to have this sort of aspect of, of engagement for the public. And carriage driving is what's happening uh, with Central Park. Um, so this gets us uh, a step back to Repton again, the landscape gardener, the English landscape gardener. Um, Repton, Repton's career is blossoming at this period um, of this convergence. And he's the first guy that looks at design based on mobility. Because when you move through a landscape in a vehicle, you experience it in a different way. There's a kinesthetic engagement with the landscape. Repton articulates core things that we see in National Park Service guidance for park roads today. For example, if you if you drive along um, a park road in a national park, um, oftentimes you'll get this wonderful view, right? Of You might get a view of a valley. Um, those of you that are familiar with DC, you drive down the George Washington Memorial Parkway and you see the Washington Monument down the river. You get a glimpse of it from the parkway. Um, these are designed as sort of accidental engagements that enhance the experience for the, the traveler, um, but they're all very carefully choreographed. And Repton understands view corridor expands based on the increase in speed. If you're walking along a ridge along the Potomac River, for example, you, you can see between a gap in the trees, you can easily see the Washington Monument. Um, if you're driving in a vehicle at 10 miles per hour, it's still pretty easy to do that. If you get up to higher speeds, though, you need a bigger gap because you're going, your movement is passing the view. So Repton is articulating all these ideas about how we engage with the landscape. So this idea of choreographing the scenery, making it seem very natural and uh, serendipitous comes out of his theory. He also talks a little about road construction, how roads should be built, um, and the idea of different types of carriage journeys as well. He articulates two different types of driving. Um, he does a lot of uh, roads in estates, uh, particularly in England, uh, but one in Scotland and one in Spain as well, because this is a new thing. Uh, so we see this idea of carriage driving very, very popular and rising in the early 19th century. And this is the foundation for Olmsted. Olmsted was familiar with Repton's work. Um, and we see references to Repton uh, as well. So that's where this is kind of all going. And would you excuse me for just one second? I need to get I, my glass of water is just out of reach. I'll be, I will be right back.
In the meantime, while we wait, I, I would encourage you, if you have any questions while Dan is talking, feel free to drop them in the chat. Drop them in the chat, or you can just interrupt me as well. And I was actually going to say with my quick pause right now, uh, any questions at this point? Is this making some sense in terms of some foundational information for you? Yeah. Terrific. Um, so, like I said, the, the key takeaway I'd like you all to be aware of is that these road systems, um, some of them may be used by automobiles today, some of them may have been abandoned. Um, they're in different stages in different parks and in, dif in, in different areas. Um, but I think it's important to understand uh, the significance of, of the road networks and the circulation. Um, Olmsted is particularly keen on this with Central Park. Um, I'm sure many of you know Central Park has a, a three-tier circulation system within the park. Um, carriage drives, bridal trails, and pedestrian paths. Um, if you've been to Central Park, the park is famous for the lovely bridges and tunnels that are all over the park. Um, the idea is to separate the three uses. Um, that's the, the brilliance of, of Olmsted and Box's design. So you have these three uses, carriages, horseback riding, and promenading. And there's a fourth layer as well, the cross traffic from New York City. There's the four traverse roads of the park, um, which are below grades. So the, the roads cross the park. That was a requirement of the park competition that there be this these crossing points for the park. Um, so Olmsted understood the, the complexities of urban life um, and the complexities of trying to find and carve out a little bit of space for yourself. Um, the example I always use um, as a Washingtonian, um, go hiking along the CNO Canal, the historic canal. It's a wonderful towpath. It's a great place to hike. It's lovely to get out into the country. Um, you kind of be like lost in the scenery or seeing some blue heron landing on the canal and someone buzzes by on a mountain bike and, you know, <laughs> kind of disrupts my whole experience, right? Um, there's always these conflicts among users. And, and Olmsted wasn't very much aware of that. So this idea was to separate all these users. So these bridges and tunnels throughout Central Park move the carriages over the bridal trail. The pedestrians walk over the, the carriage drive. It, it's all over and under. Um, and then the cross traffic for city is a layer below the park with all the city cross traffic moving back and forth beneath. So this hierarchy of uses um, and the segregation of different uses um, really helped based on the ways that people were engaging with the park during the period have the maximum enjoyment. Um, there's very few places in the park where you actually have an intersection between the two systems or the three systems. So this level of sophistication, this appreciation of circulation um, is so very, very important in, in the Olmsted legacy. Where this goes um, as we move into Brooklyn with Prospect Park is the idea of the notoriously unpleasant. If they were paved, they were in Kabul, which was not going to be a pleasant place to travel. Central Park's park roads are immensely popular and if you look at the look at the new york times if you go to the new york times archives and just look at central park history and in articles on the park when it first opens the most commented feature on the park is the carriage drives it is by far the, the best recognized and most popular aspect of this new park um, and i think this is important for us to remember how important the circulation is and the pleasure people had through these these, these drives uh, because it really, we talk so much today about Central Park uh, as a great green space, and we have all of our contemporary values on it. And I'll get into this a little bit later too. People frequently, you know, cars are bad. They shouldn't be in the parks. People should be doing this. Um, there were problems with carriages speeding in the parks. Uh, the conflicts that we have today are not new uh, at all. The problem with speeding carriages in Central Park, uh, it was a few years before New York City agreed to have a mounted police force. So the best they could do was run after speeding carriages in the park, uh, which was obviously uh, less than effective. Um, many cities, uh, anybody familiar with the speedways in the, the mid to late 19th century? Most large cities started building speedways um, to provide a dedicated space for people to like race with carriages. There was one... speed road for people to just take the carriages and race. They even have pedestrian undercrossings because it's quite a spectacle for the public to go and look. 
I'm probably telling you way more than you care to hear right now about all this background. Um, but I want you to understand that the circulation and roads and looking at the landscape through a vehicle is extraordinarily important. And thinking forward into who has right of access today and how roads should function, um, I like to go back to Repton uh, as well at the end of the 18th century. Repton talks about making scenery that was previously unavailable to the aged and the infirm through pleasure driving. Uh, as we think about an aging population right now, um, and that is a sense of being out, out in the country and engaging with fresh air and beautiful scenery and views. Um, so this idea of a level of equity, I think it's very important to think about that right now as we're considering different user groups um, in an aging population, uh, because for some people traveling can engage with with the natural world um, or the built urban park park experience so one more bit of background let me get some details about what's happening right now uh so brooklyn prospect park i'm sure many of you know the the park commissions in brooklyn were much more open uh to creative ideas and gave olmsted and vox a much broader kind of uh area just to explore and wander and brooklyn had planned an idea of a system of parks um, and the idea was because of the popular of carriage driving in Central Park, um, which just became a destination unto itself, that Brooklyn would connect all of the parks with these green corridors, which is what we, this is the origin of the word parkway. A parkway is a, 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 a it's a parkway for Olmsted. And if you read all of Olmsted's writings on parkways, a parkway for Olmsted is a green park connection. It's not a type of road that doesn't happen until 1925 with the Bronx River Parkway in Westchester County, New York. But a parkway in all of Olmsted's conversation is a green corridor that links parks and allows people to move comfortably in a green environment from a large park destination to another park destination. Well, Brooklyn had a very large and complex park program. Not all of it came into uh, fruition, but bits of it did, um, including um, this Jamaica Parkway, um, I'm getting this all right right now. Ah, I'm blanking. I think we have a Brooklyn person here, the two big parkways. And uh, yeah, please. You're muted. I'm sorry. Did you ask a question? Yeah, uh, the, the two, um, I'm blanking on the names. Oh, of the Eastern Parkway and Ocean Parkway. Eastern Ocean, thanks very much. Um, so, Many of Olmsted's parkways had carriage drives in them, uh, but it wasn't expected. Like the, the parkways and with the Boston system, many of those were, were riverways, river corridors. They didn't have roads within them, but they often had roads along the edge. Um, so this idea of these green corridors, um, and particularly if you're traveling in, in a pleasure carriage, it means you could go on a, a well-paved road from park A to park B to park C in a green corridor. These are today what we would call multimodal. Uh, the Brooklyn Parkways, um, they were much more linear and, and uh, uh, than Olmsted and Vox wished for. Um, they couldn't get ahead of the Brooklyn grid. Um, and the idea was they'd be more aligned with the topography and they just they couldn't get it fast enough. So the Brooklyn Parkways are, are very straight. Um, but we have a dedicated place for carriage driving, promenading, and horseback riding, just like we see in Central Park. There were also side access roads. As well, there's very detailed drawings of these parkway cross sections uh, in Brooklyn. Um, so, probably these lovely green quarters, they're still there today. Um, and they're still magnificent in terms of green connectors. Um, the, the, the bridal paths quickly become accommodated uh, promenades for bicycling in uh, the later 19th century as well. So, very much we talk today about multimodalism and allowing different people to travel and move. And you have all these ways to move through and connect the parks in Brooklyn. So, that's where the, the parkway idea comes from. It gets adopted for auto automobiles uh, in the early 20th century, beginning with the Bronx River Parkway in Westchester County, New York. Okay, so that's roads and circulation. So now here's the big question for today. Uh, let me stop right there. Any questions, thoughts, observations on what I've said to this point in terms of background? Is this familiar or helpful or whatever? 
Um, we do have one question in the chat that is, where can we read the Repton writing? Um, if you can answer that. Let me, um, I will I will send to you guys uh, some things that I've written that might be useful for some of this background. Um, and I can provide some links to some other, other talks as well. Um, yeah, these are nice background things to have. Other questions or thoughts before we move on right now? Okay. So as a landscape architect and a historian and a road guy, um, people just don't get roads, bridges, and things like that. Bridges people tend to appreciate a bit more because they're very tangible and site-specific, but roadways we tend to dismiss quite often. Um, this is one of the, the when I was with the uh, National Association of Homestead Parks, the previous name, um, looking at um, the Obama Center uh, in Chicago and you know the lack of conversation about the legacy of, of the park drives um, that were all part of the circulation system and the Chicago park system. So these roads, these resources, many of them have been modified over time, um, paved in modern materials and things like that. Many of them still follow the original alignment uh, of the design as well. So it's important to think about these. Um, and these create conflicts, right? Um, you know, we're very anti-automobile right now for many good reasons, um, but it's also important to understand the legacy of, of these resources as well. Um, and these were designed for vehicles, originally carriages, later motor vehicles, for people to travel through and engage with the landscape. So you have to understand that as a baseline. Um, they were viewed as park features. They weren't viewed as transportation features. It was part of the park experience for one type of user, just like we look at different user groups uh, today. And this is where these conflicts start uh, coming together, too. Again, it's people, the conflicts of different user groups, right? Uh, who gets to use the park roads and all that? We don't want the the, the 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 cars in the park because they're noisy, they're dangerous, they're polluting, right? Um, so carriages could get very high rates of speed. There's speeding problems in Central Park. Um, carriages have their own type of pollution in terms of manure and urine as well. So it's not exactly a clean operation either, um, and there's an inherent danger. There's also a hierarchy of use too. Carriages were definitely for the privileged, right? So you can talk about equity as well with all these things. Um, and these are all important questions to have, but they have to be had also within the context of the original purpose and origin of the roads. Um, what I've done, which has been adopted uh, by many groups now, um, Park Service as well, um, I developed a, a classification system for roads. Um, there's three types if we're looking at historic roads, aesthetic, engineered, and cultural. And when you're looking at a park system, it's important to understand the purpose of your roads um, and the design intent of the roads. So aesthetic roads, not surprisingly, are roads that were designed for specific engagement with the landscape. The purpose of them is an idea of beauty and engagement. Um, these can be grand boulevards, uh, tree-lined boulevards, or they can be you know, serpentine park roads. But the idea is the purpose of them is, is pleasure. Purpose of them is leisure. The purpose of them is engagement. Um, and they're very carefully choreographed. And they come with a whole series of design details that are impactful and integral to the purpose and design of the road. So not just obvious things like bridges, um, but the, the movement of the road, the alignment of the road. Materials like curb and gutter, for example, are often beautifully designed. Um, materials for signs and information, lighting, um, these are all very carefully considered and part of the landscape experience and designed to reinforce the landscape experience or reinforce a view. So it's based on choreography and exquisite design details. So whenever you are talking about making a change to a road like this, it should be treated like any other historic resource, which we often don't do. What's the material culture? What's the design intent? What record do we have of its construction? What original materials do we still have? In a case like Central Park, we have an archaeological resource directly below the modern asphalt that should be considered and most people are completely unaware of. But that's important. It's also important in terms of material culture as well. The investment in park roads uh, in the second half of the 19th century is extraordinary in the United States, beginning with Central Park. 
And the investment is also extraordinary. Again, this idea of how important this was culturally and in terms of park engagement. The first mechanical gravel crusher in the United States was used for the Central Park Roads. Up until this point, gravel was usually by women and children, was broken with by hand. Um, there was actually a, a parliamentary inquiry in the UK in the 18th century uh, to see if women or men were more efficient at breaking stone. Uh, just like you know, there was building roads was important and that was the way it was done until we had mechanized gravel crushing. The first mechanized gravel crush in the US is for Central Park. And the first mechanical steamroller is imported from England to compact the roads in Central Park as well. So this was an enormous investment in state-of-the-art technology. The reason I'm bringing this up right now is because this is happening right at the rise of the rail age, right? So all of our idea of moving people rapidly across the continent has shifted to rail at this point. We're not building public roads at this time. All the advances in road technology and engineering are taking place in America's public parks in the second half of the 19th century, which is why when we see the automobile age rising up, um, the first purpose-built roads in the United States, not old roads that we're reusing, but purpose-built roads for the car are parkways because that's the state-of-the-art technology. You can remember metropolitan New York, D.C., many cities have these parkway systems that are coming in to accommodate the car because that is driven by landscape architecture and park theory. And one other little tidbit for you, just so you're aware of this, um, if you drive along an interstate highway today, you enter at specific points, right, at an interchange. And there's usually a chain link fence that runs along the edge of the road because you can't. It's free moving, high speed, limited access. Limited access is a park idea. It comes out of the Bronx River Park way in New York. Because historically, if you own property along a public highway, you have the right of ownership to tap into that public road. And New York State said, if we're having this experience where people get in a park corridor, Bronx River Parkway connected Bronx Park with the Kensico Dam in Westchester County, north of White Plains. If we have cross traffic and lots of driveways poking into this, the idea of retreating into the park drive, the, the movement, the choreography, the engagement, the landscape in a nicely, pleasantly, responsibly moving vehicle will be lost. Um, so they developed limited access as a legal concept and saying you don't always have right of access. Um, and that's where this idea comes from in terms of automobile design. It's park theory based on focusing on the landscape. It proves itself to be extraordinarily safe and it becomes a model, of course, for the interstate system that we have today. But up until uh, World War II era, um, modern high-speed roads were being built as parkways. Merritt Parkway in Connecticut, the Rose Cycle Parkway in Los Angeles, which quickly morphed into a freeway. Um, but it's the model. We have these green quarters that have roads within them. It's a really lovely, lovely idea. So questions, comments, anything? Let me check the chat real quick here right now. Books on rep. In, uh, cultural landscapes. Statland of Farmhouse, thank you very much. Uh, okay. Um, and just feel free to speak up too. Um, so there's lots of pressure right now um, on park roads. Um, they're often not included uh, in national register listings or the minimally mentioned. Um, so one thing I would like you all to think about if you're dealing with a historic Olmsted system or any other historic park system with roads, be sure that the National Register nomination uh, is updated um, and the roads are properly included as resources. I read so many National Register nominations and listings, um, and they'll go into great detail about the brick on the house and the type of glass they used and what, where the slate quarry was for the roof, um, and then... Um, and there was, a, there was a pleasure drive that went through the property. <sighs> Not very helpful. Um, who designed it? How was it constructed? Um, you know, was there an engineer involved or a landscape architect or both? Um, cross sections, different materials, bridges, things like culverts, drainage, and things like that should all be included in the National Register. All the systems... Roads require drainage to be functional. It's that simple with the history of roads. They have to be well trained. Um, so this whole subtle infrastructure um, that is easily overlooked too in terms of culverts, drainage, um, even things like borrow pits for cut and fill. Um, there's a history of 
modification of landscape to build roads as well, where you take soil from one point or you may place soil that's unneeded when you're doing a construction project. Um, if this is well done, it's it's a very beautiful aspect of trying to help everything blend together very nicely. Um, but as people focus on types of staircases and details on right iron fences and all that, I'd like to encourage everyone to step out into the world of the circulation systems and really treat these as equally complex, engineered, invested systems that were subject to a lot of debate, budget comments, and intention for use over time. Again, because Telford and because Olmsted insisted on the Telford method, because of the of machinery that was acquired and used by the city of New York to build these roads. Um, it's a very, very clear indication this was not some accidental or secondary aspect of the park. It was very deliberate. So be sure that your nominations are updated, um, and that's very important. Um, does anyone have any pressing questions right now about a particular concern or problem with a park with roads and circulation? Yeah, uh, Mary. Um, so I, I'm with Central Park and, you know, they, I really appreciated hearing what you had to say about um, the competing uses always it being a historical problem. And, uh, you know, one of the things we're doing right now is really doing a drive study because the competing uses on the park drives when vehicles left actually became, in, it, it created a new problem, right? And, um, added to that is, um, so that was 2018. And then in, in 2020, the pandemic in New York City, we saw a rise of food delivery on not just pedal assist bike, but, you know, it, it really bicycles you know, with torque that are, you know, able to go very high rates of speed and would cut through and still do to this day, cut through the park um, as a, the most efficient means from getting from here to there, sort of a transportation you know, it's transportation as opposed to, you know, traditional park use. And yet we still have recreational cyclists, we have commuting cyclists, we have every kind of um, e-mobility out there from unicycles to scooters to you name it. And, and so, I, you know, I think one of the challenges right now is how to really manage these the today's competing uses. I mean, it's an, as you point out, it's not a new problem, but it is something that it's always encroaching on the park. And you know, there's big desire uh, to find more efficient east-west cut-throughs for cyclists as the transverse serve for um, motor vehicles. Um, but anyway, it, it, it's sort of the problem. It's it's less of a question, more of a, it is, and I know Prospect Park is dealing with the same thing. It's, it, you know, we're, it's sort of today's problem of, you know, how you very, um, you know, nicely just gave us this foundation to work off. It is the, was the problem then is uh, when the park was created, it's just different types of vehicles now. And um, it, it, it is something a, a bit of a conundrum because it, the political winds always have an impact on the favor of, of who's going to get this. For example, there is a great desire and for a lot of good reasons to increase bicycle use in the city, whether they're e-bikes or not, or not. And um, from when you look at it from um, climate change and sustainability, and yet, that use is a commuting or transportation use, not a recreational use in the park. So anyway, I, I would just love your thoughts and comments. It is much broader and deeper for a lunch and learn conversation, but I, I, we are smack in the middle of it right now. And, and I would love to hear your take. So um, I wish I had a magic answer for you. Um, I, I, I like to think if we go back to history, at least can inspire us or or sometimes comfort us, the fact that these aren't these aren't new issues. Um, so I think th this gets some sort of, you know, I think one good thing to remember too, is there were problems in Central Park with people speeding. They were using it for not the right reasons. So this, we're always going to have people not doing what they're supposed to be doing based on what we appreciate as a larger vision, right? Um, I think part of the problem right now too, is our, our whole 
push for sustainability, which which I teach here at Penn State, it's important. We really have to be responsible in so many ways. Um, but I also almost got hit by a bicycle when I was crossing the, the crosswalk illegally in DC a couple of years ago, and I shouted out after the bike, and I got a F you, I'm being sustainable. And I'm like, you ran a red light, you, you clipped me, um, but this cloak of sustainability exonerates me from any kind of social engagement or responsibility it was really quite offensive. And I thought, quite honestly, your high speed carbon whatever bike uh, has more of a, a, a climate footprint than my walking around does. So um, I'm being even more sustainable by walking uh, in terms of my footprint. But there's this sort of hubris uh at one point i think is is challenging right now and it's one of those things too it's hard to kind of say like well i'm here to support cars driving through the parks right one of my big frustrations as a dc native is beach drive which is the olmsted legacy drive through rock creek park in the center of the city washington's kind of great retreat where you really do get out of the city um when i was a kid we would always go on sunday drives along rock creek and i remember it the drives and the bridges and everything. There was even at that point a Ford, there was a Ford that was designed as part of that experience where you could drive your car through Rock Creek, which was close for environmental reasons, probably by the early seventies. Um, but today, um, many of you may know, Rock Creek functions as a, a one way kind of in and out of um, DC commuter route, Monday through Friday. And on weekends, it's closed for bicycles. Um, so the road that was designed for vehicular travel through through the city um, is available for some limited time in the middle of the weekdays when it's not being used for commuting, um, and it's closed uh, on the weekend. So suddenly the, the bicyclists have the right of ownership. A single user group now controls that road on the weekends, and I don't think that's quite fair because my father, for example, who's older now, um, has great memories of Rock Creek. And there's really, we can't, I can't take my father for a drive on Rock Creek Park and, and relieve some of those memories. Um, should we have the car in the park? You know, these all become really interesting questions. Um, stepping back more philosophically, I think it's important to remember too, when we're looking at these roads that were constructed for cars in the early 20th century, um, or places like Central Park where they were accommodating cars. Um, uh, think of the, the inverse. Um, Original cars were really intended as pleasure vehicles. Um, um, most people continue to commute by public transport. Um, and the car was the great weekend getaway. And we see all these things about, if you look at the New York Times in the early 20th century, all these drives are pointed out all through the metropolitan region, you know, you know touring scenic routes in Westchester. Um, the connection we have now had, Central Park provided the country and the city. And suddenly with the car, you could go to Bear Mountain, for example. And all these parkways are built to connect people via cars out there. Um, so it was, it was a car-centric structure, um, and it moved people to green spaces outside of the city, um, which is great. And that's people driving, and they're polluting and all that. But we have two days of people driving <laughs> as opposed to five days of people driving. So if we're looking at balance, I think that was a better balanced way of looking things uh, as well. Um, if you look at a uh, highway policy in New York State in the early 20th century, the, the the biggest traffic day, the biggest traffic congestion day of the week was Sunday because of the Sunday drive. Uh, because during the week, people were back to rail, walking, streetcars, and all of that. Um, so everything's shifting, and we're just in a new shifting mode right now, I think. And I wish I had a magic answer for you. Um, but I think we should be clear about equity of different user types. We've been working with this with um, Lake Park in Milwaukee. Um, one of the, the historic drives at Ravine Road. Uh, this question about opening up right now. And the first thing was the, the city wanted to tear down a, a legacy bridge. It was post Olmsted, but it's still a really exquisitely beautiful bridge. Um, when you have issues like this, uh, it's unsafe, it's going to fall down, all that. Get yourself an historic engineer to take a look at things. Uh, the Woodland Viaduct, if those of you know the Brooklyn, uh, Bronx River Parkway, for example, Westchester County wanted to tear it down, it said it was unsafe, it was you know going to collapse and all that. Got an historic engineer, it's fine, it's there today. Um, we were able to save um, the Bridge and Ravine Park, uh, uh, the Bridge over Ravine Road and Lake Park in Milwaukee. 
again, the city is saying it's unsafe. The deck just needs to be replaced, but it was a good way to just knock it down. Um, it's there today. The question now is, should Ravine Road be open to traffic? Um, it's a beautiful drive. It lets people engage at the park. That's what it was designed for. Um, but it also, like many parks, became a cut through with different user groups and things like that that weren't part of the park, but the park becomes a convenience, right? Um, so this is where it becomes very complicated. I find these often become very strong, like A or B options. And I think there's more nuance to this. And one of the things that I've mentioned to Milwaukee is the fact that, you know, maybe the road's open for auto traffic, you know, four hours, one day during the weekend. And it's open for certain types of bicyclists. Um, maybe it's deliberately closed during peak traffic hours for rush hour, because we don't want to encourage that type of traffic at the park. Um, but it's very easy to put up a gate or, or manage something. Um, and maybe it's a way to accommodate more users rather than having this only get out now be used for this or for that. The other thing I think it's very important too, um, if there are fatalities, if there are traffic issues and things like that, um, Excuse certainly on higher roads like parkways, for example, um, you know, it immediately comes down to the road is unsafe. Um, it's flawed design. We have to like knock this down. We have to straighten this. We have to change this. We have to cut down the trees. They're not, they're, they're hazards. Um, there's a vitality and it gets blamed on things like this. You have to go back to like, I challenge anyone here to show me a road that was deliberately constructed as unsafe and unwise. Roads are built based on vehicle type and safety expectations of the period. That changes over time. In modern vehicle today's vehicles today are really deadly. And we're seeing the huge rise in pedestrian fatalities right now in the US. But oftentimes the roads and the bridges of these historic uh, facilities get blamed. It's too narrow, it's too curvy, it's all that. It's not unsafe based on what's designed for. I'm not saying you ignore safety, but when you start the conversation out with this is inherently flawed from the start, you're already diminishing the value of the resource. And you have to start out from the point of view, this was designed, we know Central Park, they were some of the best engineered roads in the country when they opened, they were highly safe. The Bronx River Parkway was a model of safety. The Royal Seco Parkway in Los Angeles, which is the highest accident facility in LA right now, was the safest facility when it opened. So these roads are legacies of not just good park design, but good highway safe transportation design. Um, that's not to say that they can't be changed or modified um, or different users are using them now, but we need to understand when we begin the conversation like, oh, this is ridiculous. And also looking at things like driver behavior when we deal with motor issues. There was a horrendous accident on the Bronx River Parkway when I was working with that back in the 90s. And uh, teens, drinking, driving, bad weather, um, bad tires, into the tree, multiple deaths. Um, and it's tragic, um, but the parkway design was blamed. Um, it's too curvy. It doesn't have proper setbacks. The trees are close to the road. And they started cutting down trees along the edge of the parkway. Um, we can never control driver behavior, um, but we can't blame the facility for something like that. Um, and again, rather than looking at it through a modern lens and saying, so it doesn't work this way, it's sort of like, are we limiting these to the proper speed right now? You know, are we limiting these to the right vehicles? Um, these all become very complicated questions. I'm not trying to say any of this is easy, and we certainly can't solve this all in the amount of time that we have today. Um, other questions, thoughts? Um, this is Layla. I'm in Louisville, and we have an Olmstead Park system. And during COVID, we closed the roads in a couple of our parks so that there was more room for social distancing. and then 18 months later, it was a question of what and how to reopen. And the argument got polarized, um, and you kind of sort of hinted towards this. It wasn't really, you know, one side that wanted it reopened said it's accessibility. We can't get to certain parts of the park with the road closed to vehicles. The other side that wanted it to remain closed said it's safer. It's too dangerous with cars in it. And what it came down to, in my belief, was that it was really just user preferences. The people who wanted the road reopened enjoyed driving through the park, and that's an acceptable way to enjoy the park and use the park. And those that wanted it to remain closed just really loved walking in the park without cars. So we tried to come up with a compromise. It got kind of swallowed up into a lot of the um, 
political strife that was around COVID. You can't tell me to get a vaccine or to wear a mask and you're not controlling me and telling me what to do. So it all got reopened. Um, but what we found is that from a safety perspective, it wasn't necessarily safer without cars in it because cars slow down bicycles. And when there were cars present, pedestrians knew they had to be in the left lane. And when there were no cars present, they were just spread out, walking wherever, and you can't hear bicycles flying down a hill coming around the curb. So we had somebody that went to the hospital um, really badly injured from a bicycle hitting her. So it's interesting the way that it plays out um, in my experience, and I don't think that cars necessarily make it uh, unsafe. I think the reverse can also be true. And that's a very good point. Um, because there are uh, bicycles are a huge issue right now. Um, yes. And they go so fast. I mean, they're going 25 miles an hour sometimes if they're going down a hill, I mean, they can go really, really fast. Yeah. I think, you know, I mentioned earlier about the speedways that were built for the carriages in the, the late 19th century. And I think, you know, you know, it's it's the idea of intended use, right? This is a recreational system. It's designed for pleasure touring, um, and it wasn't designed for high speed carriages, cars, or I would argue bicycles, um, because are you really engaging with the beauty of the landscape? For the bicyclists at that high speed, you're in a, a pleasant place that's car free, um, with a well paved surface that can let you really fly through there. But there's lots of places where you can do it. Well, I should say there's not always lots of places. There's a lack of infrastructure for so many different user groups. Um, again, I wish I had some magic answers. All I can do is to try to prompt you to think about some different ways and, and help to articulate different types of uses. I wish, you know, it's, it's, I, I think we're, you know, I, I'm just back, I was just back from the Netherlands. And, you know, the thing I like about over there is there's such a strong bike culture in terms of rules and expectations. You know, bikes are more likely to, to pay attention to speeds and more likely to stop at places where you're supposed to stop. And uh, it's a safer environment. And there's a sense of different types of bicycling in different user groups. Whereas here, I think we have a, a strong racing mentality and, and don't don't block me because I'm 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 on my way and this is my this is my space and my use. And it's it's reckless with other users, just like reckless cars can be. Um, and I, part of me wants to start installing speed humps for for bicycles uh, just to them down and you see a lot more physical barriers in europe as well by many times especially when a, a trail is hitting a, another pedestrian crossing and if you've seen these they'll have staggered fences um that you either have to dismount or go very slowly to get through that um and that's a very effective way of controlling bikes especially when you're hitting a different one route in a second route. you know not every place has the beauty of central park with multiple layers as most of often not there's some type of an intersection and bikes are notorious at, at ignoring those uh, as well. Often other types of surfaces that are less um, pleasant. Um, Adams Morgan in DC district replaced the sidewalks with exposed aggregate because the, the pebbly surface of the aggregate uh, is very unpleasant for people on scooters and things like that. And it tends to uh, roller skaters and all that. So it, it's a way of, of trying to enforce a, a different type of behavior, for example. You know, this becomes issues of like, or how much are we modifying or changing the original design of the park? Uh, so I always go back to what's reversible and what's not. A, a surface treatment can be changed. Um, in Central Park, you already have, have modified the historic surfaces below. So changing the surface right now is is reversible and can solve an immediate problem, for example. Speed humps, I don't really care for. What I encourage anyone, if you're trying to figure out ways to there's lots of simple solutions to slow down traffic to things like traffic calming, um, but uh, some of them can actually be quite decorative or quite visually strong in terms of their response. And I'm always encouraging people with historic facilities to try to think about historic resources or, or systems or structures that um, can provide an equally effective way to manage movement uh, without drawing more attention to itself. Um, so, I mean, sometimes a really badly paved road is one of the best ways to keep traffic slowed down. Uh, you pave a road nice and smooth and people speed up right away. So it's 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 affected traffic calming. People complain about it. But I think it's important to look through all these different lenses of how we manage things. Um, I think the main thing 
really this comes back to very simply to maybe start wrapping things up now a little bit. Um, the roads that many of you are dealing with, these are roads that were built or paths circulation systems. They were built for pleasure and engagement with the park. That's a very specific purpose. Um, and I want to welcome everybody, but they weren't built for speedways. They weren't built as commuter routes. Um, and too often I find we try to accommodate these unintended users based on the regional design. Um, we have to change and evolve, I would argue, with recreational transportation um, and the type of engagement that was planned originally. Um, the historic Columbia River Highway in Oregon, uh, for example, had a couple sections, a scenic driving road in 1915. Um, a couple sections that so was chopped up a bit with the interstate system. There are a couple of sections that just are pretty disconnected. You can still drive on parts of it, but other parts are disconnected. The state of Oregon right now, Department of Transportation, is restoring the road back to its very much original. Um, and part of their argument is that a, a modern mountain bike, um, it's you on a bicycle, you're at a higher elevation than you are in a car. So you're viewing the landscape as you would have been intended in 1915. And you can go about the speed of a car during that period as well. So Oregon's looking this way to kind of have that kinesthetic relationship with the landscape through a bicycle. So it's a way to see the bicycle in a positive light and a, a, a vehicle type that allows you to really fully engage with the vision of the period, for example. Um, and I think that's, again, this shouldn't be an all or nothing. Uh, it's about trying to find this, this balance. These are serious questions. I wish I had magic answers for all of you, but I'm hoping that I've given you some ways to think about some of this. Um, I would definitely, uh, when you can, and um, you can find some information on my website, historicroads.org. Um, so uh, that's, um, we're in the middle of updating the website right now. So look a little bit data with some information, but some really good core information in there that you can find uh, helpful as well. Uh, but I think to me, one recognize that these are legitimate historic features of the park. They're not roads. They're part of the, the design fabric of the park and every bit as integral as every pavilion, tree, lagoon, lake, vista, whatever. Um, be sure that they're properly recognized and reported in your national register. Um, try to look at how they were intended for use originally. There were different hierarchies of users in many of these places. Those hierarchies of different facilities and how can they best accommodate different vehicles today? And then the ongoing conflict of park user versus people stepping in from the outside and using it as a cut through a shortcut that's when we see the problems and that's when we see the, the threats to these resources as well, because users at higher speeds and, and different types of users um, are working against the grain of what the intended facility was. And that's always subject to like problems. Any final thoughts or questions or anything I can answer? <laughs> I'll just, I'll say thank you. Um, uh, feel free, you're, you're welcome to reach out to me if you have any further questions.